So Virginia announced the title of my talk, The Maximal Operator on Convex Set-Valued Functions. And like any senior speaker, I took the liberty of completely changing the topic of my talk. Well, that's not quite true. When she asked me to give this talk, I was many years into a big project with Marcin Bovnik, but we hadn't proved the main results yet. So I decided to do a talk on some of the lead up, which I thought was interesting technical machinery. But over the summer, we think we actually proved what we were setting out to prove. So let me announce the new title of my talk, which is the Jones factorization theorem and Rubio de Francia extrapolation for matrix weights. And I'm very, very pleased. I'm almost sinfully proud of these two results. So as I said, this is joint work with Marcin Bovnik at the University of Oregon. It's been a real pleasure to work with him. And we've been working on this project since before I became chair at the University of Alabama. Um, nothing like being chair and then being chair during a pandemic to slow down a major research project. All right, so what I want to do is for the, I know a lot of this is going to be review for people in some people in the audience, but for the graduate students or people not really familiar with the theory of weighted norm inequalities, I want to run through the scalar case and then talk about the generalizations to matrix weights and then turn to my main results. So the big idea in the scalar case are the Mukenhaupt AP weights introduced by Ben Mukenhaupt in the 1970s. And so for P between one and infinity, we'll say W is in the class AP if it satisfies this integral averaging condition. So the average of W on a cube times the average of some inverse of W on, a, on the same cube, that product is always uniformly bounded. Um, if you want to try and understand this condition, it's satisfied by certain power weights. So look at weights of the form X to the alpha, <clears throat> and it's pretty easy to compute for which exponents alpha this condition holds. If you want a way to think about how these weights behave, um, I got this from Michael Lacey many years ago. He says AP weights behave like constants uniformly at all scales. Okay, so that is in some sense is one way to think about these weights. There's an endpoint condition when P is equal to one and we write it in this way, but you can think of this as saying that the maximal operator of W is always less than or equal to a constant times W. That's a different way of phrasing it. And we'll come back to that definition. Okay, so the big question that they were looking at is when can you have norm inequalities where you replace the Lebesgue measure DX by W DX? And naturally the first, item of interest was singular integral operators, actually the Hilbert transform. And so the classic result due to Mukenhaupt, Whedon, Keufman, Pfefferman in the 1970s is if T is a singular integral operator and W is an AP, then you have this weighted norm inequality. <clears throat> and the question came up later, probably starting in the 1990s. I know Bob Pfefferman was asking his students about this. What can we say about the constant C in terms of these quantities, uh, which we call the AP characteristic of W. So can we control, whoops, wrong direction. Can we control that characteristic? And there was an explicit conjecture, which said that when P was equal to two, it was linear in the A2 constant. And that was proved in general by Thomas Houtenen in 2011, after a decade of work by a bunch of people and so the sharp constant is the AP characteristic raised to the power, which is the maximum of one and one over P minus one. So uh, when P is bigger than two, the constant's one. And as P goes to one, it blows up like one over P minus one. Okay, so that was a big result. And this has led to a lot of interest in the past decade into what are the sharp constants for other operators? And I think that's still an open question. And then the techniques introduced to solve the A2 conjecture, such as sparse domination, have also generated a lot of interest in the past decade. Okay, well, I wanna talk about some of the tools that go into the proof of this, not all of them, but just a couple of them. And because these are actually of real interest as well for understanding AP weights. And so the first, is the theory of Rubio de Francia extrapolation introduced by Jose Rubio in the early 1980s. And here's how the theorem goes. So suppose you have an operator T such that for some fixed value P0, think of P0 is equal to two. And for every A2 weight, you have a weighted norm inequality and the constant only depends on the A2 or 
a P0 characteristic of the weight. Okay, so this NP0 is just some increasing function. Okay, then the miracle of extrapolation says that then if it's true for one P, this P zot, then for every P and every W and AP, you have this weighted norm inequality. So when this theory was introduced, Antonio Cordoba looked at this and he concluded that there is no such thing as LP. Okay, for P not equal to two, there is only weighted L2 spaces. And that's proved to be a very powerful philosophy in a lot of directions, particularly since there are generalizations of this theory where you can replace weighted LP in your conclusion by a variety of Banach function spaces. So you can extend a lot of the classical theory of harmonic analysis using Rubio de Francia extrapolation. And in particular for the A2 conjecture, we have sufficient control over these functions NP0 and NP that we can get what are called sharp constants. So if you prove an optimal constant when P is equal to two, then you will get the optimal constant for all P. So in other words, to prove the A2 conjecture, it was enough to prove it when P is equal to two. So um, the Francie extrapolation was central to the proof of the A2 conjecture. I should add that uh, my colleague, Cabe Mullen, did eventually come up with a very nice proof of the A2 conjecture for all P that didn't rely on extrapolation. Um, it's technical and it's complicated and extremely clever on his part, but I still think it's fair to say that extrapolation really plays a role in the proof of the A2 conjecture. So what do you need to prove extrapolation? Well, a very simple proof due to me, uh, Carlos Perez and Chema Martel, we boiled it down to three pieces, which is the duality in AP weights. So W is an AP if and only if W to the one minus P prime is an AP prime. The sharp constant exponent for the hardy littlewood maximal operator. So M is bounded on LP of W where W is an AP weight. And the constant is controlled by this power of the characteristic. So you get that power one over P minus one. And I would add that this is also sharp. Uh, this was shown by Buckley, one of Bob Pfefferman's students in the 1990s. And then the last thing you need is you need the Jones factorization theorem, which is a famous structural result about AP weights, which says that for P between one and infinity, W is an AP weight, if and only if you can find W0 and W1 A1 weights from that special endpoint class, and the product W0, W1 to the one minus P is W. Okay, so I should be clear here that actually this, in the proof of uh, extrapolation, you only need the easy half of this theorem. Uh, what I dubbed reverse factorization and everybody else laughs at that terminology, but I'm gonna keep using it. And that the easy direction is if W0 and W1 is an A1 and you form this product, then the weight W that you get is an AP. In the scalar case, that's very easy to prove straight from the definition. Um, it's a couple lines. The hard part of Jones factorization is going in the other direction. Given W and AP, <clears throat> constructing these functions W0 and W1. Okay, But again, this was conjectured by Muchenhaupt in the 70s, proved by uh, Peter Jones, and then a very different and much simpler proof given by Rubio de Francia. And, using many of the same tools that are used to prove the extrapolation theorem. And I'll come back to that as well. Okay, so that's the scalar theory. Let me now turn to sort of the more interesting question. And this is an old problem, which is, can we extend the theory of Muchenhaupt AP weights to matrix weights? Okay, this question was first asked by Nazarov, Trail and Volberg in a series of papers in the early and mid 1990s. The motivation for this comes from several different directions. If you go back to their old papers, there's uh, applications to stationary processes. Um, there's applications to operator theory. And in particular, some very interesting old questions related to vector valued Hardy spaces which boil down to matrix weighted norm inequalities for say the Hilbert transform. And so they basically asked the questions, can the theory of Muchenhaupt weights be extended to 
matrix weights, which I'll define in a second. And this proved to be an extraordinarily difficult problem. Okay, and I'll try and highlight some of those difficulties as we go along. But first, let me define some notation so you can see what I'm talking about. So going forward, n will be the dimension of our domain. So we'll be working at functions defined in Rn. D will be the dimension of our vector-valued functions. Okay, so a vector-valued function maps Rn into Rd. And then we just define the norm on this by taking the norm of the vector function, sort of an obvious way. We do this all the time. So what's a matrix weight going to be? So we'll let SD be the collection of D by D self-adjoint positive semi-definite matrices. Okay. And then a matrix weight is just a measurable function which maps Rn into SD. And measurable uh, for matrix weight, it suffices to assume that every one of the uh, entry functions is a scalar measurable function. And then we need to define the norm of a matrix. So take any one of the matrix norms here is sort of the classic matrix norm. Okay, so how do we define AP in this setting? And that actually proved to be a really hard problem because initial attempts to define it just by generalizing uh, the scalar matrix AP condition foundered. And so in the 90s, uh, Trail and Volberg introduced a definition which was much more subtle where they replaced matrices by norms on RD and then gave a definition in terms of that, which they showed in the scalar case reduced to the classic Mook and Hub condition. But a little later, early 2000s, uh, Svetlana Rudenko came up with the following condition, which is equivalent to uh, their original definition in terms of operator norms. And this was really nice because it looks like the scalar AP condition. You've pulled everything together into a, a double integral and notice you have that operator norm in there. But if these were scalar weights, the operator norm would just become the absolute value. You could separate the integrals and this would become exactly the classic scalar AP condition. But already here we see some of the problems involved. Okay, so first of all, we have to put everything together. So we pass from the product of two integrals to a double integral. And then this quantity here in the inside, it is very important that we write it in this order. And remember, matrix multiplication doesn't commute. Okay, we teach that to our students in introductory linear algebra, but it really comes back to bite us in working with matrix weights. Because if you go through a typical scalar proof, you have weights and functions commuting all the time and you don't even stop to think about it. Okay, so the lack of commutivity and the introduction of an operator norm really causes a lot of problems here. And then we also have an endpoint condition. Um, and again, in the scalar case, this just reduces down to scalar A1. And then we have to define a norm. So we're gonna write it this way, which I hate, but uh, at least for this talk, I'm gonna write it this way. So we raise the matrix W to the power one over P. We can do that because it's self-adjoint and positive semi-definite. So fractional powers of the matrix are well-defined. And the reason we do this is again, in the scalar case, if this was a scalar function, we could pull it outside, the powers would cancel and we would just get W dx. Okay, so that's our norm. Okay, so with this in mind, we can ask, are singular integrals bounded? And the original question was, is on the real line, were the Hilbert transform bounded? And we apply the Hilbert transform to a vector valued function or a singular integral operator to a vector valued function just by applying it component by component. Okay, and so a cast of thousands, uh, the original result is, is if W is an AP, then indeed a singular integral operator maps LPW to LPW, so this matrix-weighted vector space. So let me run through the history. <clears throat> In a pair of papers, uh, Nazarov, Trail, and Volberg, actually it was Nazarov and Trail, and then Volberg, and then Trail and Volberg, I think I have the order wrong, uh, proved this for the Hilbert transform, first when P is equal to two, and then for all P. Uh, about five years later, Kristen Goldberg extended this to all singular integral operators in a pair of really nice papers. 
And then because of the interest in sharp constants uh, in the past decade, people began to be interested in, can we say anything quantitative about the constant? Because neither of these proofs gives you any useful information about the constant, just that a constant exists. So in 2017, Nazarov, Petromichael, Trail, and Volberg proved this estimate when P is equal to two. And then a couple of years later, me, Josh, Israelowitz, and Kate Moen extended this to all P. And so when P is equal to two, uh, that becomes three halves, okay? And this is clearly not the same as, it's much larger than the sharp constant in the scalar case. So I wanna say a word about how you prove this result. And there are two proofs, okay? So the first approach is you want to follow through on the classic proof of Kaufman and Pfefferman for singular integral operators, which means you somehow want to relate the singular integral operator to the maximal operator. And that's where you run into trouble, okay? And where your tools start to break down. Because if you apply a singular integral operator to a vector valued function, you get another vector valued function. If you apply the hardy littlewood maximal operator, to a vector valued function, you get a scalar function. And so how do you get a scalar function to interact with weight, with matrix weights? That was the big problem. And the solution that Kristen Goldberg came up with was they introduced this operator, M sub W, where as you can see, they've pulled the matrices inside. Okay, now in the scalar case, you could pull this W of X out all the way through the supremum, and then a norm inequality for M of W would be the same thing as a weighted norm inequality for the maximal operator. And what Kristen Goldberg proved was that indeed you have this. This operator maps vector valued LP into scalar LP, okay, precisely when W is a matrix AP weight, okay? That's a really beautiful and technical proof. Um, and then the question came up about sharp constants. And so Josh and Cave in 2019 basically dug into their proof, looked at it more carefully, and they showed that this operator, this, this uh, maximal operator satisfies a sharp constant bound. I should stick a constant in there. The key is, is that in terms of the AP characteristic of the matrix weight W, you get that same power, one over P minus one. And because this is sharp in the scalar case, it's also going to be sharp in the matrix case. Okay, that was the first approach. The second, and I think much more exciting approach, is Nazarov, Petmerkel, Trail, and Volberg in their paper of 2017 extended sparse domination to the vector valued case in a way which was made sense for matrix weights. So here's what they showed T is a singular integral operator, F bounded function of compact support. There exists a sparse family of dyadic cubes. Um, if you don't know what that is, think of it as, as a family which has some overlap, but the overlap is very, very small and you can control it. And then they showed that if you apply T to your vector valued function F, so remember this object right here is a vector, it's contained in this object. Okay, so let's see what this is. So this is supposed to denote an average, but we put double bars because they define this object. So what you do is you take your vector valued function F, you multiply it by any scalar L infinity function of norm less than or equal to one. So in some sense, what you're doing is you're taking your vector F and you're shrinking it pointwise. Okay, so in each direction you're shrinking it, maybe if there's a minus sign, it flips around. And then you take the average of those vector valued functions and you form this set. Okay, which turns out to be a convex set in RD. Okay, and then you take the sum over all of these, and this sum is an infinite Minkowski sum. So you're just taking two convex bodies and adding them together, which means you add pointwise all the points in the sets. So you can do this as an infinite sum. There's a natural topology for talking about this. This sum converges. And so you have that this vector is an element of this convex body. Okay, so this looks something like, I mean, really looks like the kinds of uh, 
sparse operators that were used in, say, learner's proof of the A2 conjecture. And indeed, they were able to leverage this to get some vector valued estimates that they could then apply matrix weights to. And they got for when P was equal to two, they got the power of three halves. Um, Cave and Josh and I came at this from a slightly different direction, brought in some tools from the theory of two weight norm inequalities, and we were able to use the same sparse domination to get the result for all P. <clears throat> okay, so with these tools in hand, there are three questions, okay? First, is the A2 conjecture true for matrix weights? Um, We've got P equals three halves. There seems to be no good reason for why it should be three halves. So I think everybody believes that the A2 conjecture is true, that you should be able to get, for P equals two, you should be able to get the power one, and you should be able to get the other power for all P. That's still a wide open question. Looking at the theory of how we proved the A2 conjecture in the scalar case, we would like to be able to reduce it to the case P equals two. And that requires Rubio de Francia extrapolation. So this leads very naturally to this question. Does Rubio de Francia extrapolation hold for matrix weights? And in fact, if you go back to those early papers by Nazarov, Trail, and Goldberg, they ask these sorts of questions. Do these deep structural theorems um, hold in the matrix case? And then thinking about what does it take to prove Rubio de Francia extrapolation, does the Jones factorization theorem hold for matrix weights? Or at least does the reverse factorization that you need in the scalar case hold in the matrix case? So three big questions, and this is the big change. Uh, I'm very pleased and excited to announce that the answer to the second, to the second and third questions is both yes. And that's the big result that I now wanna talk about for the rest of my talk. Okay. So first, let's state them. Rubio de Francia extrapolation. And the statement is identical to the statement in the scalar case. So for some P naught in particular, P naught equals two. If for every matrix weight in a P naught, you have this weighted norm inequality for some linear operator T, again, say a singular integral operator, and you have a certain function NP naught so that it depends really only on the matrix weight characteristic, then for every P and every matrix weight W, you have the same inequality with this new function N sub P. And more importantly, for the proof of the A2 conjecture, these functions are the same up to some additional dimensional constants, and I mean both dimensional dimension n and dimension d, that show up in the scalar proof. So in particular, if you get the linear constant when p is equal to two for singular integral operators, you will get the sharp constant for all p, for p not equal to two. Okay, so we have proved not only Rubio de Francia extrapolation, but we have proved sharp constant extrapolation in the matrix case. And on our quest to prove this, we have also proved the Jones factorization theorem, but in a kind of a funny looking form. So I'm gonna to have to explain this. So again, given any P between one and infinity uh, and a matrix weight W, W is an AP if and only if, and here's the funny looking part, you have two matrix weights W0 and W1 and A1, but there are scalar multiples of your original matrix W, okay? And W can be written in this way. All right, this looks a little funny because we're imposing this extra condition on W0 and W1. This is not as bad as it looks for two reasons, okay? First, in the proof of the Jones factorization theorem in the scalar case, if you start with a matrix W and AP and you create your scalar matrices W0 and W1, if you look at the proof, in fact, W0 and W1 have this form, okay? So 
it's not so bad that when we prove factorization in the matrix case, we get the same phenomenon. Going in the other direction, as of yet, we don't have that we can do this for general W0 and W1. But in the proof of extrapolation theory, this is the form in which you have to use reverse factorization. So when you're building your A1 weights, this is what comes popping out. So in that regard, this theorem is enough to prove uh, Rubio de Franci extrapolation. Now, very recently, as a matter of fact, at like nine o'clock last night, I got an email from Marcin Bovnik, and he thinks that he can now prove the stronger version. So he thinks that if we have any W0 and W1 and A1, then this product is going to be an AP weight. Um, I'll have to see what he's done. So we think that's true, but we spent a lot of time trying to prove it and ended up proving what we needed to prove extrapolation theory. But um, I'm hoping he's right. Okay. What I want to do now is I want to talk through the machinery that we built to prove this. Okay. And so here's how we started. And this is what I'm going to call a very short outline of the proofs. Okay. What did we want to do? Well, we wanted to follow the scalar proofs. Okay. You know, when you're teaching, your first analysis course, this is what you always tell your students. Well, if you want to prove a new result, that's a generalization of an old theorem, just try and follow the same proof and see what you have to change. Well, that's what we set out to do kind of naively. And Marchand was absolutely convinced that at every step, whatever tool we used in the scalar case, there should be a matrix equivalent. And all of the work was trying to figure out what those equivalents were. And here was the biggest obstacle. What do we do with the maximal operator? Okay, because in the scalar case, the maximal operator takes scalar functions to scalar functions. And in particular, you can iterate it, which lies at the heart of the uh, Rubio de Francia extrapolation theorem when we build something called the iteration operator. Okay, but we can't do that with the maximal operator with matrix weights. Okay, you take a vector valued function, you apply the maximal function, you get a scalar function. There's no way to iterate this process. Also, you're throwing away information. Because if you think about it, a vector valued function has geometric information built into it. Not only does it have a magnitude, how big is it, but it's pointing in a direction. Okay or directions as X varies, the direction of the greatest magnitude is changing in some way. As soon as you take absolute values and pass to a scalar function, you throw away all that geometric inform information and all you are left with is magnitude, okay? That's a big loss because if you think about it, matrix weights have directions built into them as well. Take the simplest case, if it's a diagonal matrix, Okay, each diagonal entry is some function, and they're going to be as x changes, the direction of the largest eigenvector is going to be changing as well. So there's a lot of geometric information that's going to be captured when you multiply that matrix against a vector valued function, and you're going to lose all of that if you take absolute values. So our goal was to find a replacement for the maximal operator that somehow captured all of this information. And so we actually began thinking about this, uh, I guess, independently of the Zara, Petromichael, Trail, and Volberg, but we hit upon basically the same idea from a different direction. And for us, the idea was to move directly to convex sets. So let me introduce some terminology here. I'm going to let script K be the collection of all convex sets K in RD that have the following properties. They're closed and bounded. They're symmetric, meaning if X is in K, then minus X is in K. And they're somehow full dimensional, which you can describe as saying they're absorbing, meaning that zero's in the interior, okay? So the best example of such a convex set is a D-dimensional ellipsoid centered at the origin, okay? And that's actually gonna play a really big role 
We're going to want to take norms of these sets. And so we're just going to do it by, we take all the vectors which are, which are contained in K, we take the norms of those vectors, and then just take the supremum over all of those. And then, like I said, a good example of these kinds of convex sets are ellipsoids. And you're tempted to want to reduce down to just thinking about ellipsoids because of the John ellipsoid theorem, which says that given a convex body K, there's a unique ellipsoid of maximal size that's contained in K, and K is contained in a scalar enlargement that depends only on the dimensions, square root D. Okay. So maybe what we've done can be reduced down to thinking about ellipsoids, but I don't think so. I don't think so. I think you really have to work with all convex bodies. Um, just when you start computing averages, it's not clear that the average of an ellipsoid function, and I'll talk about what that means, stays an ellipse. You have to work in this larger collection of convex sets. All right, so now we want to pass to convex set valued functions. So we're going from scalar functions to vector valued functions, now to functions whose values are convex sets and RD. Okay, now thankfully we did not have to build this theory from scratch. There's actually a long established theory and analysis of convex set analysis. And so things like what does it mean for a function f that maps Rn into script k to be measurable? Okay, so we were able to piggyback onto all of that. But one thing I want to point out is how easy it is to pass from vector valued functions to convex set valued functions. So if little f is a vector valued function, I'm going to associate to it the following convex set valued function, where what do we do? We take just f and minus f, and we take the closed convex hull. And so that's just going to be a line segment connecting those two points in RD. All right, this isn't absorbing because it's a line segment. So I'm sloughing over some technical details here. But you can think of this as any time you have a vector valued function, there's naturally associated to it a convex set valued function. Okay, and then we're going to define this space, LPK, <clears throat> where we take any convex set valued function F, we multiply it by the matrix W. And again, we just do this point by point and then take the norm of this. This is some new convex set. So we just take the norm of the largest vector in it integrate that. So this looks like an LP space, and you can think of this as the LP space of convex set valued functions. It's not a Banach space because it's not a vector space, because the only addition you have is Minkowski sums, and there's no inverse <clears throat> in this space. Okay, But it is a metric space. You can define a metric on it, and it has, it's closed under this metric space, under this metric, excuse me. And so just go ahead and keep pretending that this is a Banach space and you're generally okay. All right, so now we want to integrate. And again, there's a theory of integration floating around out there uh, due to Allman in the 1960s. So this is called the Allman integral. <clears throat> so first we have to define a, a family of vector valued functions, S1. And this is called the collection of selection functions. And it's basically all the vector valued functions in L1 such that point-wise, little f of x is contained in the convex body f of x, okay? Now, you might be saying, well, that's great, but how do we know any such functions exist? Well, it turns out that one of the definitions of when this function f is measurable says that such functions exist at least as measurable functions. And if you impose very modest restrictions on the convex bodies in F, <clears throat> then you can in fact show that these selection functions are L1 functions. Okay, so again, the theory of analysis on convex sets plays a nice role. And then we define the integral in the following way. We just take every possible selection function, integrate it over the domain omega, that's gonna be some vector. And then we take the set of all of these vectors and that gives us some body in RD. And it's easy enough to show, well, maybe not easy enough to show, but if F is a closed convex bounded body, so if F is in K or maps into K, 
then its Allman integral is a convex set in K as well. Okay, so this is pretty natural. This we're taking the integral of k-valued functions and getting k-valued results. And then just to connect this back to what uh, Nazarov, Trail, Petter, Mikkel, and Volberg did, if you go back and compare the definitions, if you start with a vector-valued function f and form this average, really what they've written down is exactly the same as the average of the Allman integral of the associated convex set-valued function, okay? So the kinds of things we're doing are just a direct generalization of what they did to define convex uh, sparse body domination. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, so with this in hand, we can now define the maximal operator, okay? So think about what we do with the maximal operator. We take a function, we take all the cubes that contain a point X, we take the average of that function F and we find the largest average, okay? We wanna do the same thing now for a convex body, but we don't wanna throw away the geometric information, okay? So largest would mean, well, it's a big, the average is a big convex body. How do we find the biggest one? Well, it turns out that the easiest thing to do is to just take the union of all of those convex bodies and take its closed convex hull. Okay, so in other words, again, giving a function f, we form this quantity, and then mf is well-defined, and it's also a convex set-valued function. Okay, so that was the key property that we needed, that the maximal operator mapped convex sets to convex sets. Now, and here's one of the reasons why we have to work with convex sets. If you start with a vector-valued function and apply this, you get a convex set, you don't get another vector valued function. So it does not map con vector valued functions to vector valued functions, okay? And then we want this maximal operator to have properties as close to the scalar hardy lulu maximal operator. So MF should be bigger. And since we're talking about convex sets, we do that in terms of inclusion. So indeed F is contained in MF. We need some kind of subadditivity. And again, here the plus means the Minkowski sum of two convex bodies. And so again, M of F plus G is contained in MF plus MG. It's homogeneous with respect to scalar constants, so we can pull alpha in and out. Nice little thing here is we don't have to worry about whether alpha is positive because these are symmetric bodies. So multiplying by alpha and multiplying by minus alpha are the same thing. And then lastly, it's very easy to prove that this is bounded on this space LPK, where the norm, we just take the standard Euclidean norm. And what was really striking is the classic proofs for the hardy littlewood maximal function lift to this setting almost word for word. Okay, and so that gave us a, a lot of hope that this was really the right maximal function. And so then the next step was to prove weighted norm inequalities, okay? And so we proved the following result, that if W is an AP weight, then our maximal operator maps LPK into LPK with respect to this weight W, okay? And more importantly, again, thinking ahead to proving sharp constant extrapolation, we got the right bounds. Okay, we got exactly the same bounds on the constant as in the scalar case. Okay, when we first started working on this, I really wanted to prove this just by adapting one of the proofs for the scalar case for matrix for weighted bounds for the maximal operator. We are still not able to do that, and I'll come back to why in a second. So, the proof here we actually have to pass through the Goldberg maximal operator. So we do some estimates and we show that in some sense, if we apply M to a, a convex set F, and then we pass to the Jones ellipsoid, it's like applying it to the vector valued functions which correspond to the axes of that ellipse, and then we can move forward. And that's how we're able to get this sharp constant is using the results of Josh and Cave. 
But I want to come back to this problem of can we prove this directly so we don't pass through uh, the Goldberg maximal operator. And what this would boil down to is proving bounds for some kind of convex body sparse operator, slightly simpler than the one uh, used by uh, Nazarov, Petromichael, Trail, and Volberg. And that's where we're hung up. And we really think that if we can prove it for this maximal operator using that approach, then we can prove the more general A2 conjecture for um, singular integrals. Um, but that in itself is, I think, an interesting and important question that we're still working on. Okay. And then lastly, we needed a notion of AP or at least A1 in the convex setting. And so what, how, what's one way to define AP or A1 rather for the scalar case? Well, you apply M to a uh, function W and MW is less than or equal to a constant times W. So we can do exactly the same thing here. If we have a function F maps into the convex bodies, we say it's a convex body A1. If when we apply M to F, it's contained in a constant multiple of the original function F. So remember, we have the opposite inclusion right here always. So going this direction seems to be A1. And then we found really sort of the magic piece, which connects this to matrix A1. So if you have a matrix weight W, W is an A1 if and only if you form the associated ellipsoid. You multiply W by the unit ball B in RD. That's some ellipsoid now, okay? And this is a convex set valued function, F. And if this F satisfies convex body A1, then W is in matrix A1 and vice versa. So this was the magic tool, which is gonna let us pass back and forth from matrix weights to convex bodies, okay? And then this brings me now to the fundamental tool for proving extrapolation, the Ruby of the Francia iteration operator. So here's the definition. And if we replaced everything in there that was about convex bodies with scalar functions, this is exactly the object that you use to prove Ruby of the Francia extrapolation. It's this iteration operator. So let's walk through what it does. You take a matrix in AP. Well, M is bounded on LPK with respect to W. So this is its operator norm. And again, we have sharp estimates for that. And so we form this sum where we just take iterates of the maximal operator. M maps convex bodies to convex bodies. We can now iterate the maximal operator. And then you form this sum. And so again, this is an infinite Minkowski sum, okay? Now, with all the analytic machinery, this makes sense. It's easy to show that it actually lives in LPK with respect to the matrix W. And it has all of the properties from the scalar case. So in particular, it's R of F is bigger than F. You have this containment. How do you use this? When you're proving extrapolation, you have these arbitrary functions and you want a nicer function to appear you replace it by the Rubio de Francia algorithm applied to it. Then you're gonna to have to get rid of those operators. So you need bounds. You need bounds that you can control. And so you have this weighted norm inequality. RF in norm is less than two times the norm of F. Okay. And again, that's really easy to prove in the scalar case and much the same proof follows through here. Although again, you have to be very careful about the analysis of these convex bodies. And in particular, dealing with an infinite Minkowski sum of convex bodies has some technical issues associated with it. And then finally, the most important property, you apply the Rubio de Francia operator to any convex set valued function and you get a convex body A1 weight. And you have really good control on its A1 constant, okay? Which is really just in terms of the norm of the maximal operator, okay? These are the three pieces um, that drive the proof of the extrapolation theory. So without getting into all the technical details, you do a duality argument, you get T of F, you get some weight, 
you make the Ruby of the Francie iteration algorithm appear, and then you use reverse factorization to form a weight in AP0, the place where you know your weighted norm inequality forms. So the last thing that we need to make this work in the matrix case is reverse factorization. Okay, and again, in the scalar case, that's almost free. It was not free in the case of convex set valued functions. So what did we do? Well, again, the goal was let's just try and follow the proof from the scalar case. And once we built all of these tools uh, to get the Ruby of the Francia iteration algorithm, the hard part from the scalar case, the factorization itself, that proof lifts to the matrix setting pretty easily. Okay, I mean, there's, there's technical problems, but nothing that we couldn't handle. Reverse factorization almost killed us, okay? And really, this is where the fact that matrices don't commute um, again and again was killing us. We could not figure out how to overcome the lack of commutivity improving reverse factorization. And so the resulting argument that we came up is extremely delicate and it uses what in some sense is like an interpolation theorem. So indeed at one point we were actually trying to use um, Reese interpolation theory or you know, the, the theory of the K functor to try and prove it in terms of interpolations of, of Bonnock spaces. We moved away from that, but the argument is still kind of an interpolation of norms and that's the key. We can no longer work with the definition of matrix AP in terms of matrices. The only way we were able to prove this is we had to go back to the original definition from the 1990s of AP in terms of norms on RD. And I thought that was really surprising. And it points to the fact that that original definition really was a very profound and insightful definition. So that's where the theory stands. We now have these two major pieces of the theory in place. And I think moving forward, the whole notion of analysis on convex bodies and weighted norm inequalities for convex set valued functions is going to be the final tool that we need to prove the A2 conjecture. Um, if you look at the proof in, uh, uh, Nazarov, Petermichel, Trail, and Volberg, or my proof with Josh and Cabe, where we did it for P not equal to two. You've got this beautiful sparse body domination, but then you throw away all that convex set valued information and pass down to some vector valued objects. And I really feel that in doing that, you're throwing away information, information that you need to take that exponent from three halves to the conjectured sharp one. And so that's the problem I'm working on. There's still a lot to be done in this area, um, just all the varieties of extrapolation theory and then proofs for other kinds of operators, sharp norm inequalities for fractional integrals, for commutators, for square functions, that whole theory uh, awaits development. So I think I did this just about in the right amount of time. So thank you very much for your attention. And since I work at the University of Alabama, I have to finish by saying, Roll Tide.